Today's program is in celebration of Food Day, a grassroots movement taking place across the country with events bringing people together from all walks of life to push for healthy, affordable food produced in a sustainable, humane way. Now, for almost two years, the Museum of Science has been producing programs that explore food, from growing, cooking, and eating it, to examining the safety, security, marketing of it. So we're really proud to be part of the conversation on this first annual Food Day. I'd like to extend enormous thanks to Whole Foods Market, who supports our Let's Talk About Food initiative at the Museum of Science. We are very thrilled to continue our explorations of food from all points of view, and thank you for your support. Um, I also want to give a huge thank you to Louisa Kasdan, the president of Let's Talk About Food, LLC, for helping us assemble a truly distinguished panel today. We're honored to present the film Food Fight and privileged to have the director, Chris Taylor, with us this afternoon. There are at least five screenings of Food Fight happening across the country today, and we are honored to join that list. After the film, we're hosting a mighty group of panelists um, So, what, for what promises to be a very lively discussion, and we hope that you will stick around with us for that conversation. And now, um, I'd like to present two people to help us set the stage for viewing the film. Um, the first is Meg Murphy, who is a healthy eating specialist from the Whole Foods Health Starts Here program, which is a very innovative um, initiative that Whole Foods has taken on, and the director, Chris Taylor. So please join me in giving them both a warm welcome. Hi, I'm Meg from Whole Foods. Um, I'm the healthy eating specialist there. And our program is definitely aimed towards reconfiguring the typical American plate, um, which has a lot of processed and unhealthy food. We're trying to bring people back to the Whole Foods instead of you know potato chips, going back to the original, like potato. Um, we definitely want it to be nutrient dense. So that means choosing the most bang for the buck on the foods that you are getting. So going for a kale and dark leafy greens, fruits and vegetables, making more of your plate, you know, a colorful array of those plants that are gonna be giving back to your body. Also, we are eliminating oils and sugar, and instead we wanna have healthy fats like plants, avocados, and also we wanna be teaching people all along the way with lots of recipes. We have hundreds of healthy recipes online, and yeah, we're here to be a resource. There's a healthy eating specialist in every store. You can come with specific questions to your diet, or just come in for a cooking class and we'll teach you how to do it and how to shop on a budget. So we're really happy to be here. If you have any questions, come out to the table afterwards and I can explain the program to you, offer you a lot of resources and give you some great yummy recipes. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Meg. And Whole Foods, uh, which has been a, a partner of Food Fight across the country for the past three years as we've uh, screened the film in, in um, close to 100 local communities. Uh, it's a, an honor and a pleasure to be here at the Museum of Science. I was a frequent patron and have enjoyed the institution for many years when I was here as an undergraduate uh, in the 70s. So it's a, a wonderful kind of return, uh, return home in that sense. Um, food fight is a murder mystery. And it's it, it basically the story of what happened to taste in our food and who murdered it. Um, I hope you enjoy it and thanks for coming. We are now um, poised to embark on a great conversation. Um, and so to get things started, I'm gonna introduce our illustrious moderator, Ms. Allison Arnett, who is the former restaurant critic and assistant managing editor for the Boston Globe. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Let's Talk About Food, LLC, which is uh, thrilled to have this opportunity to continue the conversation on food. Food Day is, is a 
a great way to concentrate for one day on something we all care about and we hope will have a future that's, as, as Chris has said so eloquently, more delicious than it has been in the last couple of decades. Um, I'd like to introduce the panel. Uh, I'll have them come up. This is Chris Taylor, the director. Chris started, um, he, Chris went to Harvard and then started as a uh, lighting designer for rock and roll. Uh, he has a very diverse career. And then moved over into films and was director for four seasons of CBS, uh, I never watched these programs, so I have to, The District, <laughs> which, was a, which was a detective show. Uh, this is his first feature film and I will ask him a little more about that later. It's very interesting that he chose food as the first thing to concentrate on. In the film itself has won, as, as Lisa said, many, many awards from around the world um, and is being shown uh, continually at events like this and at other events. Uh, uh, Scott Soros is the commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. <laughs> Head egg. <laughs> he comes from southern Massachusetts, from a farming and, and uh, fishing background. He was the, the um, Mass Ag's first agriculture uh, commissioner, or coordinator, I guess it was called. Um, he's especially, now that he, he represents all kinds of farming, he's especially interested in nutrition and getting good food to a lot of people, and in the legislative, both national and uh, state, of making, making sure that farming impacts everyone's life. Uh, David Waters is the CEO of Community Servings. Yeah. Community Servings started as a feeding program for, um, for those suffering from AIDS that now serves almost a thousand people a day um, with meals and this includes not only AIDS, uh, people afflicted with AIDS, but also with other life-threatening illnesses. Um, he is, he knows a lot about how to get food to a lot of people, nutritious food, uses food from uh, farms and uh, local growers and also has job training and other kinds of programs to help those he serves. Um, I will now sit down so we can all be together. And uh, we're gonna have a conversation and then invite you to ask questions. So it'll be just an intimate day at the museum. <laughs> um, Chris, I was struck by the fact that you started this film because you love food and good wine. You obviously had your heroes mm -hmm. and heroines and Alice Waters and the whole North, Northern California um, movement for real taste, and then you ended up with the Farm Bill. Can you tell us how that happened? The, the journey of making the film was, um, was not a simple one and not without obstacles. Um, and many times I'm asked what made me start a film about food, and I end up a answering the, the real question, which is what makes you finish a film about food, because the finishing of the film is actually much harder than the starting. And the film started as a, as a kind of a, um, a lighthearted romp through California, the California food movement, and I had a lot of interviews with the uh, various um, people who came out of Chez Panisse, many of whom have shaped food across the country, famous chefs that have, were trained at Chez Panisse and then have gone on to great careers um, all over the country and all over the world. And that was a, an interesting film uh, to a few of my friends who were hardcore foodies, but it really wasn't an interesting film to me. Um, at the end of the day, I had two, two acts of a film, and I didn't have a third act. 
because really the relevance of the California food move movement ended in 1981 when everyone kind of borrowed the ethos of Chez Panisse and started doing farm-to-table restaurants, which have you know spread uh, throughout the country to the uh, advantage of all of us eaters who now eat incredibly uh, delicious food that's usually grown locally and 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 done uh, done up in a very simple fashion by you know very talented chefs. But after 1981, you know what's the rest of the story? And the fact is, the rest of the story is incredibly political. And this movement that came out of Berkeley and spread, and it actually, you know, for the point of the film, because I live in California, I, I told a very California-centric story. But in fact, this movement obviously uh, grew independently in many places around the country, including the Northeast. You know, we've had a number of really great food activists in, in Boston, in the New England area, in Philadelphia, Judy Marks, for example, at the White Dog. Um, so. Uh, the point of that story is that it's really political. And the, the, the sensuality of food and what Alice Waters started and what this kind of 60s uh, counterculture ethos produced, which was essentially sensual to begin with, ultimately turned political, and that became really fascinating for me. Ultimately, our food choices are political, no matter how sensually we want to eat, and that, that led to the third act of the movie. Uh, I found Will Allen. I found Ron Kind, a Harvard graduate, class of 87, who was a quarterback on the football team. Um, I thought he was basketball. Uh, <laughs> he he played basketball. He, he played basketball he as well. Basketball. He's one of the best basketball players in Congress. Um, in fact, he met Ron Flake, and they partnered up for the bill playing basketball. Flake is kind of a conservative uh, Republican in, in uh, New Mexico. I believe, yeah, New Mexico. Um, but anyway, the, the point of that is that the, the film became political and the journey of the film and what kept me making it was trying to find the political relevancy of what, the, what that food history was and how to bring it into the present and how to make it relevant for us. What choices did we have and how can we take something away from the experience and make the, the world better for our families and for our communities and for the world? And, and you can do that through your food choices. Thank you, Chris. Scott, I, I think that for a lot of the Northeast, uh, particularly city dwellers, the thought of the farm bill is commodity and it's Midwestern. Uh, could you tell us how, this, how the farm bill relates to us in the Northeast? Um, certainly. First, let me congratulate Chris. Fantastic. Uh, I think you did a great job documenting the history of the Farm Bill. Unfortunately, our sitting down here today, we're kind of where the story picks off. It uh, picks up, and many of you may be aware that there is uh, Farm Bill development uh, in place now. Some have guessed that it might happen as soon as November 1st because of the super committee that's meeting that fortunately we have one of our senators sitting on. Uh, so ultimately, we are in a great place now to have some influence over the Farm Bill. But to your question specifically, uh, the Farm Bill actually has comprised 70 plus percent of food nutrition programs. Uh, fortunately, we've been able to tap into that to some degree. And some of the things that you may be familiar with that have happened here in Massachusetts are things like EBT and SNAP at farmers markets. We're now among the 80, 245 markets we have here in the state, 80 of those now have access uh, through EBT and SNAP, many of those, in fact, in more urban communities, and many of the neighborhoods that are typical of what Chris highlighted in, in his film that didn't have any other access to fresh, locally grown pro produce. So we've seen some great opportunities as a result of those, and ultimately what we hope to see uh, for our growers, uh, the, in spite of the, the kind and flake, flake bill not making uh, the cut in its entirety, we did see shifts in the 2008 Farm Bill that gave us things like a specialty crop block grant program for agriculture. Uh, that's meant for us and for our growers their ability to really enhance and diversify their production to look at any number of different types of winter crops as an example. So we'll see now any number of, of farmers markets that will be open uh, throughout the winter. We'll have last year, I think we had 17 winter markets, year before that 12, the year before that none. 
Uh, so we're actually seeing much more in the way of development. Some of you may have read that we're having the development of a, a year-round public market uh, in Boston, not unlike uh, the Philadelphia Reading Terminal Market, Pike's Place Market, to again give year-round access. And for this market, we've heard loud and clear that you, the eaters, the consumers, everyone out there is really looking uh, for a direct access, direct opportunity to buy specifically Massachusetts local products, fisheries and, and agriculture products. So I think uh, the Farm Bill, as much as the commodity payments and commodity program is a small piece of that, that doesn't really have much impact, uh, really any to speak of, uh, for growers here in Massachusetts. Other components in the Farm Bill are very important to us. Uh, and the argument that we've been making all along is that we need to look at, uh, for the Farm Bill itself, uh, instead of just increasing more, more access, more, more demand that encourages more access, we need to look at the totality of the Farm Bill and look at some of the conservation programs as a part of that that really give our growers an opportunity to meet those demands and, and still keep the costs reasonable. It's expensive to farm in the Northeast. It's expensive to farm in Massachusetts. In fact, we are, uh, have the unfortunate distinction in Massachusetts of being the third uh, highest cost ag land in the country between us, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, uh, where farmland is very expensive here. So the different kinds of programs, such as farmland protection programs, some of you may not be familiar with a farming ranch protection program that comes out of the Natural Resource Conservation Service. But that program in itself uh, provides the state with 50 cents on every dollar that we spend for permanent land protection that we have here in the state. And for Massachusetts, we actually rank at the top of the list for the states around the country, in spite of our size, for the permanent protection of farmland, and in fact, have the oldest state farmland protection program uh, in the country at this point, protecting somewhere north of 66,000 acres permanently uh, for, for agriculture in the state. That's still only 12% of the total arable, arable land mass here in, in Massachusetts, which really brings in uh, the whole region as it being a part, us being a part of a regional food shed and the different programs in the Farm Bill really providing us tools and resources to help enhance diversity, grow the farming community, and really help them meet the demand that they're continuing to see more of now uh, from the consumers for access to locally grown agricultural products. Uh, David, I want longer wanna... than you <laughs> Sorry. No, we'll have more. Uh, David, one of the things that's often said about organic food or even real food is that it's too expensive. You, you are a specialist in getting food to reasonably cost, at a reasonable cost to a, as many people who can't pay for it themselves. Uh, what do you say about that? Um, Costs us $5 a day to feed somebody. I challenge anybody in the audience to feed, feed somebody for a whole day for $5. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that it made me think of was I, uh, Community Servings did a project a couple years ago in South Africa working in the townships uh, around Cape Town trying to change uh, what they were feeding people with HIV. Uh, and uh, big international feeding programs are about filling your stomach. So what they were working with was essentially cornmeal mush. And that was a way to stave off your, your hunger pangs. Um, but it certainly wasn't the right thing to interact with HIV drugs uh, or get healthy in general. And I was thinking today, um, anticipating the movie, that um, we're in many ways in the same situation here. Uh, it's very, uh, we spend very little money on food, um, and those who are poor are uh, the most uh, vulnerable to that because what's available to them is cheap food that has absolutely no nutrients, but it fills their stomach. Uh, and if you can provide a dollar a day to feed, or a dollar a meal at McDonald's to, to fill your child's stomach when they're hungry, uh, and you can't afford broccoli or pears or anything else in the produce section, uh, you're going to turn to the fast food. Uh, if you're working two jobs, you're going to turn to the microwave. Uh, and processed foods. You're going to, if you can't get to the store, you're going to go to the corner store and have a bag of chips and soda uh, because that's what's there. Uh, and the vegetables that are there are gray and unappetizing. So uh, what blew me away most about the movie was the, the graph of the cost of food and uh, the health costs because that's what we see amongst poor communities. Uh, and we host a farmer's market in a poor community um, but it's very hard to convince people to that it's not that it's meant for them. They think that it's only for the people on the other side of the tracks. That's a great, yeah. great question, Allison. It's really the central question that uh, is uh, that contains the whole food conundrum. And we could, 
and I would love actually to sit here and talk about it for at least an hour because the complexity is really fundamental to understanding the issues of, of food. But the thing, there are a couple things to remember that the, the, this problem with cheap food and unhealthy food and the the way our food system has become distended is essentially an economic problem. And it probably is going to have to be fixed economically. And the idea that we have teased out the health care costs of industrial food is a really fundamental uh, to the fact that, you know, that industrial food is cheaper than healthy, organic, locally, farmer's market grown produce. I mean, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's not true. The economic balance is in favor of, of healthy, nutritious food. We're marketed much more successfully by Kellogg's and General Foods and, and the big you know, in, industrial food conglomerates to think otherwise. But in fact, the, the, the uh, economies of, of scale are all obviously in their favor. The other thing that's going to help us and this is the, the, I mean, the unanticipated question here is, what hope do I see for the future? Uh, that, that these large economic entities are going to start coming in on the side of the consumer. And the vehicle for that is the health care bill, because it, once Kaiser Permanente realizes that to cut their premium payouts, they can actually advocate for, health, for lifestyle uh, choices, which are basically diet-based healthy eating, farmers market driven produce diets, once they start advocating this as a lifestyle choice as a condition for membership or some other you know, equally uh, pro bono kind of advocacy position, you'll start, seeing, uh, you'll start seeing our food system change for the better. It's as Michael Pollan says, big talks to big and Blue Cross and Kaiser Permanente are big. And when they say we want healthy food, to help our bottom line, we're going to start seeing that in the in the pipeline at a much greater extent. One thing I think is interesting, it's not that I'd never heard it before, but it always strikes me, is that we can call anything but basically what goes into processed food specialty food. Um, do you think that will change? I mean, specialty food is, is what we need to eat. Yeah, well, we, we actually, based on the, the, the diversity of agricultural products in Massachusetts, we're actually thankful that there's been more emphasis on specialty foods and specialty <laughs> crops, uh, primarily because the big four, the soy, wheat, corn, uh, rice, uh, they really don't have any, any bearing on the programs here in Massachusetts. But even cranberries is one uh, that is viewed as a specialty crop, a specialty food program. We've seen the shift in the Farm Bill last time around that we hope to continue to see in the next Farm Bill that will continue to give us more in the way of, of resources to help further the access to those, those locally grown specialty, even though they are specialty framed as specialty products, especially food, especially food crops. And also to both Chris and David, I mean, to say that there's hope in this, I, I can see that, but I don't think the corporate hmm. guys are going to give up. I mean, not at all. <laughs> not at all. They're, uh, I mean, obviously they're, you know, they're well entrenched and, and uh, I mean, we, you look at the, f the food system really is a, as it currently exists, is a, is a function of capitalism at its most efficient. And so you're not going to see um, kind of health advocacy that doesn't have a payoff for the bottom line in any CEO's you know, quarterly reports. So that's just not going to happen. But I like what Chris said about uh, health care reform, because mm -hmm. if we can turn one large corporate entity against another large corporate entity, we may have more power. Uh, and if we can cut health care costs by changing the way people eat, um, we may have some hope. Because um, I don't think rallying the streets for local tomatoes is probably going to uh, change the farm bill, at least not uh, today or tomorrow. It's, if I could just add to that, I think it's a, it's a great point. If you start to look at the percentage of farmers nationally, you know, compared to the percentage of population that we have, we're seeing nationally uh, a smaller number of farmers across the country. And in fact, talk to any farmer, uh, and they'll grow what the market wants them to grow. So if the market starts to demand more access to broccoli, to tomatoes, to lettuce, to any number of other product, veg specialty crops mm -hmm. out there, they're going to start to shift their growing to grow those instead of corn, wheat, soy the commodity crop programs that they're in, they're in now. They're going to grow to the market. The same is true for our growers here. When we see even the small state of Massachusetts, we rank sixth 
now seventh nationally now, the number just shifts for the numbers of farmers markets in the country. That's a result of the farming community responding to the kind of demand that our consumers are asking them to respond to. In fact, during that same period, we saw growth in farms here in Massachusetts, 27 percent growth. We've never seen that before. We saw a, law, a, a stabilization of the loss of farmland. Never seen that before either. And it's because the consumers, and this is again why timing is great for this having this discussion, you all can have a major impact talking to your own legislative folks at the federal level primarily over the importance of farm bill and farm bill programs that can really influence your access and people throughout the community equitable access uh, to locally grown agricultural products uh, here in the Commonwealth. The, um, I, if you are inside this movement, if you have been, as I have, working with chefs who believe in local and, and I do and I garden, and you begin to think that this is a big movement, and I sometimes wonder if, if that's not just a, just a dream, that can Americans actually step out of the last 40 years, do you think, of eating the way processed food giants told them to eat. I was chuckling during the movie because it's never been in my, uh, in my biography, but my grandfather was vice president of research and development at General Foods wow. <laughs> in the 40s and 50s. Uh, and we ate a lot of TV dinners in my household. Uh, I, I think that the, I come from the restaurant world as well, and uh, I think that it's a very powerful, uh, community experience and a quality of life experience, but I don't think that uh, by themselves they're going to change the way uh, the system works. Uh, if you look at what we pay to feed our children through school programs, uh, $2.50 to feed them is what the government pays. Uh, if we look at what we feed our parents through Meals on Wheels, there is no room for quality food. The, the reimbursement rates are too low, uh, and that's not where we ostensibly want to put our tax dollars. And until it is where we want to put our tax dollars, uh, we're going to feed them very poor quality food. And in my world, that doesn't even include feeding the sick and the vulnerable and the homebound uh, that don't get fed at all. Um, so unless we can find within our tax dollars, within our government, within our sense of a community, the need to provide better food, uh, I think Alice Waters' efforts is, are great uh, in the schools, but uh, ultimately most schools can't afford to have a kitchen, they can't afford to have a cook, and they certainly can't afford uh, local produce based on what USDA is reimbursing them for. So until we all get angry about that uh, and turn around the way tax dollars are spent, there's no room for improvement in the really large consumers of food, which are school programs, elder meals programs, uh, and that sort of thing. And I think that's probably the single largest growth area uh, for kind of a progressive food paradigm in that the kind of the farmer market consumer model is steaming along very nicely and sales are really uh, kind of robust and a lot of farms are finding it or finding you know a, a, a very successful lifestyle based on on that model but the next level is for farms that are too big to sell to farmers markets where are they going to go and and you know we're starting to see some inroads in the school system in New York these sorts of things are happening but it's got to happen on a on a much bigger level nationally, and again, this is where I think of the Kaiser Permanentes and of the world kind of being able to make a difference it, once they put their muscle into this niche, which is too big for direct sales to consumer, but p for people who don't want to have a thousand acre farm and, and grow corn and soy, that there, there are going to be markets in, in schools and hospitals and kind of this next niche, which would be very successful for kind of the 50 to 250 acre farmer. So I'm um, you know, cautiously hopeful that you know, that niche can grow as we move into kind of a more healthy kind of paradigm. And just the other note that I wanted to add, Allison, is that uh, the power of the restaurant, and I didn't make this point as strongly in the film as I would have liked, that the, the restaurant industry is hugely important to the progressive food movement. It's, and it gets kind of knocked as an elitist, you know, st substrata and Alice Waters and her 
her you know, left-wing foodies, and Anthony Bourdain is especially boorish about not realizing you know, the, the kind of the sophistic, or not realizing the lack of sophistication of his argument. But it's important that restaurants lead the way and chefs lead the way because they are doing the R&D for farmers uh, and the vehicle for, for that R&D is the farmer's markets. But chefs are telling farmers wh what to grow. We want this new plant. We want, for example, Celtus, which I'd never heard of, but Dan Barber has his grower, one of his farmers growing Celtus. Uh, in, in the Union Square Green Market. And so we're getting this kind of uh, biofeedback loop, which is really important, not just to the, to the kind of the economics of it, but also to the bio, the seed genome. We're getting these, you know, these, uh, these, the diversity in the food supply. Is a lot of that's fueled by restaurant dollars. And right now, 50% of our out of the home spending on food is restaurant money. So it's yes. a very important component to getting food kind of even better than it is now. One, one thing I think is interesting in, in <coughs> this came out of restaurants and, and then out of farmers markets is that people are eating, as, as the Whole Foods people would say, more kale. I mean, they're eating things that, that went out of the diet for a long time. Who, who ate rutabaga, you yeah. know, and five years ago? Absolutely, and even, even with, with farm to school, we, I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, we have seen some pretty major steps in farm to school. We've seen changes in law that are provided uh, for prefer preferential purchasing of local products. We now have uh, about two-thirds of the 300 school districts now in the Commonwealth that have per preferenti preferentially pur purchased local products right now, and that's grown over the last two years. The dollars, dollars that were generated, just to put it in economic perspective, uh, $750,000 worth of purchasing to a million point two dollars worth of purchasing within a two-year span from schools direct to farmers. That's a remarkable development in a very short amount of time where we have had folks like out in Worcester, for example, here in the city of Boston, they're demonstrating that you can replace tater tots and french fries with small potatoes from the Pioneer Valley or from Hadley potato growers at a lesser cost than it costs them to purchase potato of uh, uh, fries and, and, and tater tots. I think the comment about gearing up uh, kitchens, purchasing kitchens, we have many schools that don't even have kitchens at this point. Yeah. So and there's no question, there needs to be a lot more investment in those facilities to give them the capacity, give them the ability to take that local raw agricultural product and turn that into healthy meals in the schools that they're, that they're providing it through. Well, the, uh, a lot of this comes down to cooking, I'm afraid, <laughs> because um, that's really, it's cheaper, as David says, if you cook your own food, it's cheaper than buying uh, at McDonald's. I mean, that, this new uh, experiment to cook on $5 a day or a $5 meal is shown over and over again to be true. You just have to do it. I sound like the doomsayer today, but um, one of the things I really worry about is that there's a whole generation <coughs> that doesn't know how to cook. Uh, you know, some of us learned at the you know knee of our our grandmothers or mothers, but there's a whole generation that their mothers were microwaving, uh, their mothers were out in the work world. Uh, they needed two two salaries. Uh, they you know there were more and more opportunities for McDonald's or fast food or Denny's or whatever it might be, and unless we figure out a way to teach people how to cook again all the farmers markets and all the poor neighborhoods don't do any good. One of the things we do at Community Servings uh, that's been successful is we have a farmers market in a poor neighborhood and we take food stamps uh, and all the other coupons. Uh, but we tie our nutrition classes and our cooking demonstrations to the same time as the farmers market. So, and people don't gen generally like to go to nutrition classes. Uh, so we say, if you come to the nutrition class, we'll give you a $5 coupon to go use at the farmers market. Now, if you've never seen spaghetti squash, you don't know what it is, but our dietitian and our chefs cook it for you, and you taste it, and you say, wow, that's delicious. Uh, and then we hand you a coupon, and the farmer's outside in the parking lot, and he just picked the spaghetti squash. You start to have the potential to change people's behavior. But unless you can do that on a much larger scale and uh, maybe bring home ec back into the school systems, um, we're it's a big ship to turn, and uh, there's a lot of people that we need to get excited about cooking and tasting and eating. Yeah. Absolutely, and if I could add, uh, just to pick up on 
the comments around the, the big uh, corporate health care facilities kicking in. I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Foundation for some of the great work they've done here locally, teaming up with Wholesome Wave uh, with the Department of Transitional Assistance with others to help double value of coupons, which stretches those dollars even further at farmers markets, at CSAs, roadside stands. So it's expanding the access opportunity by increasing the dollar values av available through those markets to individuals who oftentimes need that access the most. Mm -hmm. So I think it's smaller scale, we'd love to see more of it, but it's a, it's a crack in the dam, we think, uh, to uh -huh. see folks like Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Foundation stepping up and providing real dollars to co connect with programs like the Boston Bounty Bucks program or up in the Lawrence markets or out in the Holyoke area to provide those double coupon values with their partners Wholesome Wave to make that, make that happen. Uh, to bring it back just to end with the farm bill again, I mean, what, what can we do? Uh, what can we do about this? Uh, you said well, the call your... Yeah, the, I mean, it's, there has to be direct communication between you and your legislator mm -hmm. about the farm bill because historically the farm bill was done, it wasn't sexy enough for, you know, for the general public to care about. I think that's changed. That's, that's obviously changed because uh, now farm bill's really sexy. <laughs> um, but people so have to connect the yeah. farm bill to what they eat. Absolutely. Instead of the farm bill to yeah. uh, Archer Daniel Midland. You know, the real, the interesting thing is when I was researching that, I wanted to find out who the bad guy was in the, in that equation. And I thought, uh, you know, it's got to be ADM or Cargill, and, and I found it to my surprise that no, it wasn't them. It's actually the big growers, the owners of the thousand-acre farms, are the guys that are driving all the legislature and getting all the. You know, they're fighting the. There's a, uh, a you know a, a bill now to end direct payments, which is the goal of the Kind Flake Amendment, and uh, it looks like that's going to pass. But they very cleverly kind of introduced a replacement for direct payments that'll kind of, you know, keep the money flowing to the big growers. But, I mean, Scotty Pippen is one of the biggest growers in the country. David Letterman's a big grower. So all these people are getting hundreds of thousands of dollars in direct payments, and they're actually, you know, some of the biggest farmers in America live in Manhattan, um, and it's an investment vehicle for them. <laughs> so I, I, that didn't exactly answer your question, but... Uh, go ahead, Scott. No, I think uh, Chris hit the nail on the nail on the head. It's, it's you need to talk to your your legislative representatives, uh, and fortunately for us, and I think it, it was great to see the list uh, of the former uh, members, 44 different members of the Ag Committee on the House side, uh, that right now, in fact, and for the first time in most people's memory, we actually have 10 members on that 44 member committee that are from the 10 Northeast states. Four of them are from New England states. Our own Congressman McGovern. Uh, from uh, Joe Courtney from Connecticut, Peter Welch from Vermont, and I'm going to draw a blank on the last one. They're going to string me up. But we have 10 members now from the 10 Northeast states uh, that are represented on the Ag Committee, which is, is pretty remarkable and a first time ever. And in fact, and part of the reason I'm wearing what I'm wearing today, and I apologize for not getting more dressed up to come out, we've been t participating in a number of gleanings over the last several days, and I was joined by Congressman McGovern at Tugas Family Farm in Northborough, uh, on Saturday uh, to pick, and we actually picked about 2,040 pounds of apples as a re at that gleaning event. And for any of you aren't familiar with gleaning pro projects, there's been about a million pounds thus far from 12 different projects that I've actually shared with uh, uh, food feeding pantries, uh, the Boston Food Bank, the Worcester Food Bank, number of food banks around the around the state. Uh, that those programs come to the, for the product at the farms. But in any event, uh, the fact that we have those members now, our own members in New England, uh, is a really a big step. Uh, and we also have, I left out on the table, uh, I've been working with my counterparts in those 10 Northeast states, it's the six New England states, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware, uh, who are all framed as the Northeast Agricultural States Department of Agriculture, uh, to put together our priorities uh, for the, the upcoming Farm Bill. And we've left uh, out front, we've just finished a, a document, two-pager, uh, front and back, that really identifies all of those different important priority programs that we are now circulating uh, with uh, those members of Congress, those members of the Senate, uh, that uh, to give them the message about what's important in the Farm Bill. But now is the time, for sure, uh, to get the word out about the importance in those programs to your own members of Congress. Thank you. And I, w I just wanted to add that in the f of the Farm Bill members you saw in, in the film, um, Representative Randy Neugebauer, he's the guy who, t who kind of stumbled through his joke about the farmly far Farm Bill is not friendly to family farms, uh, he actually, I, I gave him his start in show business 
by being in this film. And then he went on and took it to a whole new level when he yelled out baby killer in the uh, healthcare debate. So I, I can't be responsible for how he managed his career, but I did start him. So He had a great accent, a a along with the guy from Arkansas. Marion Marion Barry. I mean, is that it's name great. so great ubiquitous? Name. So ironic. OK, I think it's about time to open up to questions. And I'm a little confused about what you said, David. You said you feed in people for the whole day for five dollars, right? Please interrupt me as soon as I make a mistake of quoting you. You also said that it, the school lunches get two dollars and nineteen cents a day for a lunch. I think it's two twenty-five, okay. two fifty. Okay, 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 uh, but more than two nineteen. I don't understand how you can feed an adult for five dollars a day and cannot feed a lunch to a child for two twenty-five. Well, we do five dollars a day with all free labor. Uh huh. So you're not talking so any. So five dollars is basically paying our food costs, uh, and that doesn't include the donated food that we got on top of that. Uh, so we can provide a higher quality meal because we get a lot of food donated. We get a lot of free labor, and we get uh, partnerships with local farmers and fishermen who are giving us all their gleanings. Uh, but if you're completely tied to the reimbursement rate, as most schools are, because they need to put, they, they don't have enough money for pencils and paper, let alone subsidizing their meal program, uh, and elder programs that are completely government subsidized, they can't, they have no wiggle room. It's only what the federal legislation will reimburse. Uh, and that's why we get frozen sandwiches shipped in from New Jersey to feed our kids, uh, because that's where the big purveyors are coming from. And uh, you, you know, it's try and try and shop and give your kid a, a good meal for two dollars and twenty-five cents. We're doing it through the generosity of the community. That's right. Uh, they'll bring a microphone to you, so it takes a few minutes, seconds. I was just wondering, because when I saw Super Size Me, Morgan Spurlock's film documentary a while back, he said he made the argument, and I just assumed it was true, maybe it's not, that healthy lunches like salads and stuff in the schools would cost the same as the current lunches of fried foods and whatnot that they serve now. So is that not true then? Because he was making the argument in the film that the cost is actually the same. So I'm just wondering why that shift hasn't happened. Yeah. Or there haven't been nutrition classes or you know, you know, know, other things put into place that could help the transformation process. Yeah, and this, um, and I'm, I'm gonna speak a little bit out of school, uh, but from, and no pun intended, but from, <laughs> from, from our own perspective, what we've seen is that the, the school districts, depending on who they are, uh, they end up getting involved in a, a contract with a food service uh, provider, a, a school food service provider. Those food service providers will quote on the prices, quote on the dollars that are available to them, some of which are the free lunch programs or the free lunch programs, the dollars that are provided through government subsidy programs that give them essentially their budget. Unfortunately, what also happens to some school districts is those are the areas where they try to cut programs the most, where they start to see cuts in programs that really constrain the school food service director's ability to look at different types of food products. One of the challenges that we've run into with farm to school in this state, and I would, I would bet for any, any uh, more urban community that's distant from uh, rural communities with a lot of agricultural production, is how do you uh, commingle, how do you aggregate product from any number of smaller farms that are, as Massachusetts average size around 80 acres as an example, how do you get the product from all of those farms aggregated and then delivered in an economic fashion so that you're not spending, spending most of the money, in fact, not for the food product itself, but for the delivery and shipping, for actually getting the product there. So we've seen there have been some real creative folks. I've mentioned some of them already. Uh, I'm, I'll come back to Worcester as one, uh, Donna Lombardi, who's done a fantastic job really diving into what are the individual costs and doing a lot of work on the school food service director's part to really go out and source those different products and then working with early receptive administration in her own school food service program, her own school program, uh, to help put that together and make those bids so that, again, she can replace you know, the, the prepared, you know, uh, fried, uh, different products with 
more fresh things like, like potatoes. So it's, it's a lot of organization, a lot of identifying what will work from an aggregation and delivery perspective. And that's one of the things that the Farm School Project in Massachusetts has been doing, is try to help them navigate, not only from the school food service side, but from the farmer side. For those who are engaged in something beyond direct sales, those wholesale sales, rather than just selling them uh, to a, a Chelsea market or the New England produce market, and then having a, an aggregator pick those up and then deliver them around, they're looking more to the direct sales opportunities and learning how that will happen and how it works, how it works for them. So it's, it's a work in progress, I guess, is my, my short answer. Part of that is putting kitchens back in the schools, yeah, too. I was going to say. Uh, yeah. One of the things that they took out was any you know staffing beyond scooping and serving, and uh, the uh, kitchen workers don't aren't trained to cook, um, and there's no kitchens and there's no ovens. We feed four schools on a for-profit basis, and the meals are packaged hot in our kitchen and brought directly into the classroom because none of those schools have any place else for the kids to eat. The other thing is that also all of you represent kind of a vanguard of people who are passionate and committed about food. And think of the idea of if each one of you rounded up three friends, especially the people who are really concerned about food, if you rounded up three friends and, and got involved in your school food uh, in, in a very powerful way, the change that you could make is uh, remarkable. So that, that would be kind of my hope is that people who come here to see the film who do represent the choir, as it were, uh, of this movement would proselytize on behalf of your beliefs and, and, and grow this movement by, you know, three or four hundred percent. So that's, what, that's my hope. And the school food is a really ripe area for that kind of organization. And I would expand that to, uh, you know, if you're growing a community garden and half of it goes to low-income neighbors and half is for yourself, uh, or you're delivering meals, or you're helping to raise money to feed uh, somebody, there are many ways to get involved um, in the food movement. And uh, they all need more soldiers, more, um, more members of the choir, as Chris said. Um, yes, I'm from Concord, and we've been lucky that our Board of Selectmen have adopted sustainability principles after our town meeting voted that um, this spring. Uh, we've already gone through an energy inventory and are about to embark on doing a similar project on food, that is identifying the kind of food mapping of how much land we have that's arable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have some questions for you about Food hubs, because one of the things that we're talking about is we can't necessarily be just on our own. We have to depend on others. And <coughs> secondly, um, how concerned are you about the big seed houses being controlled by Monsanto, for example? Um, everyone is concerned, deeply concerned, by the lack of diversity in the seed genome. That's going to be a huge problem going forward, especially uh, that the, kind of the undiscussed issue of water use, uh, which is probably the fundamental problem with food, um, especially with industrial food, that the water requirements are, you know, six to ten times more intensive for, you know, for Roundup Ready uh, seeds and, and the seeds that provided the quote-unquote green revolution. Um, it's, uh, you know, yeah, th those are sustainable issues. Uh, sustainability issues are, are basically being ignored and glossed over and in some cases lied about by large companies that have vested interests in, you know, what their own products are. Um, I'll turn it over to my friends. Uh, I don't know that much about it, but I do know that uh, there are there's a gr great local company that's an aggregator uh, called uh, Organic Renaissance th um, that's based out of Athol, and they work with a lot of small farms that uh, can't compete because their crop of carrots is too small. They couldn't even provide m probably my kitchen with what we need. Um, but if all of those small farms come together and they f they funnel through this. Uh, food warehouse in Athol, uh, and uh, there's no profit being drawn by the by the uh, trucking company that's managing all of this, uh, and they use the best technology. 
uh, in terms of routing and that sort of thing, that there's there's the ability to start to uh, make these connections in a small agricultural community like New England. Yeah, I I, I agree one one hundred percent, and I think we have one good example, uh, not in Massachusetts, unfortunately, but south of us in Pawtucket, uh, where FoodX and others have been working to put together just such a food hub type approach. It's worked really well, especially in a state like Massachusetts where we do have typically smaller farms, small family farms. And as I mentioned earlier, they're trying they're coming up against the challenge over distribution costs and actually getting the product there. The other thing that food hubs can do, and depending on how you develop a food hub, it can also include something like a community kitchen. Uh, or some kind of community preparation a location where there is one, I know JP has one, there's another one out in Greenfield, uh, where they actually have the raw agricultural crops can come in, and then they can be manufactured into a value-added product, whether it's a sauce, jelly, or jam, or something like that, that then can be manufactured at a large scale, lower costs, that then can be provided as a food product from that those raw products that were put in there. I'd like to hear your comments on a personal <coughs> perception that is leading me to be very skeptical. And that is that 30 years ago, organic was a very alternative consciousness and it was hard to find those growers and they were more expensive. They were like in health food stores and so on. But somewhere along the line in the late 80s or 90s, I think bigger business realized that there was a significant market share happening there. And now I can go into Stop and Shop and see their organic vegetables or um, all natural. That one drives me crazy when I see that on products, all natural. What does that mean? And, yeah. and also, yeah, also there's that little circle that's a certified organic, but when I see that on products that are overpackaged and made by larger manufacturers, I don't trust it. You're, you're, you're right to be skeptical because the organic brand has been co-opted exactly. uh, probably beyond meaningful uh, you know, status, in especially in the larger supermarkets. The only way you can really be um, uh, sure is by talking to the farmer. That's why I advocate farmers markets as the ultimate source. You know, having said that, I certainly would give good faith to my friends at Whole Foods. I think they've done a good job of it. Um, but in general, you know, I think that in the larger chains, you know, they co-opted that term. I think if I could also add to that, it's most of the farmers that I talk to, uh, rather than pursue organic certification, they're growing organically. They grow or using organic methods, and they grow using the least amount of either organic chemicals, which there are, uh, or conventional chemicals uh, on their own crops when they grow those crops. And it's an economic decision to some degree to use the limited, uh, the least amount of material that you need to to get that product to market. But ultimately, many of those growers, although we certainly have seen growth in the organic market and the organic numbers of farmers here in the state, uh, many of those that I've talked to, in fact, have said that they grow using organic methods. And I think what we've seen is that the fact that it's local, the fact that you know the farmer, as Chris was saying, you might buy it from someone at a farmer's market now, uh, that's been a bigger driver for market. And I think coming back to your example of whether whatever supermarket it might be, is when they say it's local, you hold them to that and you actually ask them to demonstrate the fact that it's from local. Whole Foods has done a great job with it. There are a number out in the western part of the state that have also done great jobs with it, but you need to really hold them to that because I've heard, believe it or not, some say that local to them is 24 hours on a plane. You know, so it's, it's close in time, but it's on a plane. You can go a long distance in 24 hours. I think that um, we all need to challenge every grocer, not just you know, not just a natural grocer or a health grocer or an organic grocer, but y you're handing over your money. As Wolfgang Puck was saying, you're paying. You're paying good money for this. You have a right to ask him exactly what that means. I guess, what about the consumer that does go to a big market like that and thinks that they're doing something good for, for their family, for the earth, you know, for the economy and so on, and they're buying products that, as you said, have been co-opted by bigger business. It's, you know, it's just, it's very frustrating to me that... Well, there are steps and there are half steps uh, and quarter steps, and if that grower is actually replenishing the soil, 
that's a great thing. You know, it's good for the environment. If you know, but if there are obviously if there are other conditions that are not ideally, ideally, you know, in the consumer's interest, that's a different thing. But you know, small steps have to be if they're actually valid. You know, we we have to respect them as well. I will actually Google search the farm by itself, call them <laughs> up from whatever number they have on there, and I'll ask them, did you deliver eggs to this supermarket and when? You know what I mean? And I know it sounds obnoxious, but that's the way oh, I do it. Good like for I, you. Like I do almond milk. I only drink almond milk. I will call Silk, and I'll say, when did you deliver this milk? When did you process it? And they'll do that because I'll tell them, you know, I, I spend X amount of money per month in you know buying your product, they understand that and they'll see the way that you get your answers. So that usually helps that way. We also live in a capitalist world, and uh, if enough of us put our dollars into organic, then the big companies are going to want to do organic. Um, and yes, I'm sure there are some that have have co-opted it, but there's also. Uh, some that are probably doing uh, organic just because they saw there was a market for it. Um, you know, uh, it was it was here at the Museum of Science. Uh, uh, the owner of Stonyfield Yogurt, Hirschfield, Hirsch and Gary uh, Kirschen. Gary Hirschfield said at a previous uh, let's talk about food. He said when Walmart asked to buy my organic yogurt, as much as I hate Walmart, uh, I was thrilled because that means that the interest on, in organic has filtered all the way down to the customers at Walmart that Walmart wants to buy it. And then you start to see real systemic change when those large companies are willing to invest in it. So it, it's, I, I always would want it local first, but I don't think we can run our entire food system on local first. And I, I would add that Lay's was making local potato chips in Florida and branding their bags as local. So even that you know, even that label is co-opted very easily by the large food processors. And Walmart actually just gave a million dollars to Will Allen, yeah. um, so that's a great thing. Hi. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to thank all of you for the work that you do in really bringing this topic to light and, and discussing it with, you know, clearly a passionate group. But it forces me to kind of think about um, this on a more global scale, um, you know, in kind of this seemingly inevitable moral obligation that America has as a role model for the rest of the world and how we eat. Um, and, you know, just I was going through and seeing the, the 25 diets exhibit too and kind of seeing, you know, the food patterns that, that we have in this country are also in, you know, countries that, that we wouldn't think would be also eating, you know, Lays or having eight bottles of Coke a day and things like that. So, Chris, I was wondering, you know, do you have any plans to take this to a more global level and kind of figure it out that way and kind of extend, you know, what we're seeing in this country and what we know about eating good food to kind of, you know, a more broader scale. Well, the, the message is a complicated one uh, because what you're describing is, a, is one of the most complex equations involved in food as a topic, and that is how, how we export starvation internationally. I mean, essentially, we're exporting empty calories through commodity food programs. It's all corn, and our, our, you know, our hunger relief is all corn and so soy based. Uh, the one exception of that is Will Allen has taken over President Obama's initiative uh, to combat, uh, and this is with the Clinton Foundation, to combat starvation in Africa. And he's exporting his, his kind of, I, it's not Rube Goldberg, but it's very similar in the sense that it's his technology, I, it's not right to describe it that way, but it's a very simple uh, technology in terms of farming and taking this to Africa and rather than just dumping corn and soy and non-indigenous -ind foods, kind of integrating their food culture and how they, how they actually grow food into their agriculture. So that's kind of a promising thing. Um, the bigger question about, I mean, what, what are my plans? I don't have plans to take the film internationally because it's kind of an American story, although the film has sold internationally. Uh, and, and 
you know, that the international issue is so complicated. I, I'm wondering if it can be done in one film. Um, but there is a, there are many stories to be told about starvation and the, the Green Revolution, which I think is a myth. Um, you know, and the kind of the, the proportion of starvation is risen against as a percentage of population, despite the, the claims of the Green Revolution. Uh, and then the, the essential fact of water use in the Green Revolution, which has devastated uh, India, for example. Um, and, you know, starvation is not abated in the last generation. It's gotten worse. So, you know, that's a, there are a lot of questions there that would take a lifetime to answer. And have taken many, you know, many brilliant people, and many foundation, you know, millions of foundation dollars to, to, to deal with, and so far unsuccessfully. Uh, hi, uh, my wife and I run the farmers market down in Quincy, Massachusetts, and we're interested in how uh, farmers markets can be a site of many of these innovations, farm to school and hubs and mobile markets and so forth. And my question uh, to each of you is, is there uh, a model farmer's market that you've seen that you'd point me to, to say, yeah, they're really out on the, the cutting edge? Well, from, from my owner's perspective, and I'm going to use another word that could be a pun, they're organic. I mean, the, the, your, your market evolved based on the interests in that community, I'm assuming. And we've seen the same thing for a number of farmers markets around the area. And you provide products in a, in a range of products, and whether it's agricultural products or craft products or any kind of entertainment, uh, prepared foods that are really uh, aligned with the interests of your community. So th those that I've seen that are successful, and there are many of them, uh, they are in tune with the needs of their community, the community they serve. Uh, so as much as you're attuned to the needs of your own community and you make shifts in your market that really addresses those kinds of needs, that's, in my opinion, is how you'll continue to see success uh, for your market. And thank you. This is just so that the audience knows the uh, farmers markets and the 245 that I mentioned around the state, that's a, a entirely volunteer effort. So uh, kudos to you and your efforts to do, to do the work of farmers markets. We can take one last question. The one to follow, not to follow is the Union Square Green Market in New York. Incredibly political and divisive and very inefficient. So <laughs> I found out the hard way. Yes. Um, I do think that there's hope in educating our youngsters. I've seen it myself um, just volunteering for city sprouts where there's gardens in all of the elementary schools in Cambridge. Is there any money in the Ag Bill for building gardens at school or? There's going to be money uh, for school gardens in the next bill. I mean, we're optimistic I say that like I'm an expert, but <laughs> I think there's a very good chance you're going to see that. But I, I didn't want to hijack your question, so. No, no, no. I think there is actually kind of follow the money thing. I, I do think kids get, um, the kids just get so excited about growing their own stuff, what it tastes like. I mean, there's such a uh, personal investment, um, and it seems like there should be some money going, you know, at that very basic yeah. level. Yeah, we're 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 very optimistic, as as Chris indicated. Uh, I, I I would wish that we could say certainly there will be. Uh, it seems if things continue the way they did with the last farm bill, especially with folks like Kathleen Merrigan, uh, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, who's the number two person at the USDA now, Massachusetts native. We're very happy to have our locally grown Under Secretary of Agriculture at the USDA. Uh, but the efforts that she's undertaken to make the, 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 the Know Your Farmer opportunity come real, uh, the high tunnel greenhouses that give us the season extenders, the education opportunities that we've seen through things like SNAP, where there are ed education dollars that come along from the USDA to help with the education programs. Those are all things that we're advocating for that we would hope similarly the public would advocate for and would make it so that those things would be more certain uh, in the upcoming Farm Bill. Uh, as I think you've you heard throughout, uh, it's a big challenge. You, you're trying to change things that in the Farm Bill that have been in place uh, for multiple, multiple decades at this point. Uh, even for my own counterparts out in the western part of the state, the southwestern part of the state, the Midwest, uh, they too are looking at the kinds of things that we're doing, the direct marketing opportunities, because they're farmers as well. They'd love to have a much greater connection 
farm a lot less land and have the ability to make that same amount of revenue that they need to support their families, and in many cases, multi-generational families, using those direct connections and direct agriculture like we do here. The benefit we have is we're close to our market. And our market uh, is, really, is right as our neighbors, basically, here in, in Massachusetts. And as a part of a regional food shed and a regional food opportunity, working with our neighboring states, which I think is where the opportunity is uh, for our counterparts in the Midwest and the Southwest, also provides similar opportunities as long as they can see that. And again, it comes back to what the consumers want. The more that you want the local, the more opportunity the farmers will rise to that and, and grow that local, opportunity, that local market. I would also add that in now f going on five years that I've been working on the film and getting it out there and sp and screening it, um, the there has been an exponential rise in the kinds of programs you're asking about. Uh, people like the, the Will Allens and Eric Allens are in every city in the country now. Um, the school garden programs seem to be in every school district or about to be. Um, I mean, Jamie Oliver's program in prime time. Could you have imagined a prime time show about healthy school food three or four years ago? It's wildly successful. So I look at these things, these kind of mega trends, and I'm optimistic that, you know, that people, you know, that there's a, a groundswell of energy and interest. And, uh, you know, Kathleen Merrigan is a huge stealth appointment. Uh, it was a brilliant stroke, I think, by President Obama uh, under under Vilsack. It was she's been really successful, and and it's uh, she, and and then the uh, Michelle Obama's work with obesity and and the garden. I mean, they got it going. So I think we have a cause to feel good about what's going on, and hopefully we can keep growing this trend. And one thing that I think is beginning to be apparent is that the corporate culture, not so much the food processing, but the corporate culture is beginning to realize that aligning itself with, with cute children and good food might be a good idea. <laughs> okay. I think, yes, I think this is it. We're